Welcome back, Scoliosis Dialogue listeners. Um, this is Cynthia Nguyen, and on today's episode, I have the pleasure of talking to Dr. Scott Zuckerman, neurosurgeon and co-author of the article Rod Fractures After Multi-Rod Constructs in Adult Spinal Deformity Patients Fused to the Sacrum or Pelvis. Where do they occur and why? This was in the March uh, issue of the Spine Deformity Journal, um, and uh, upon podcast committee voting, uh, we decided that this was one of the most interesting articles of that issue. So we're super happy to have Dr. Zuckerman uh, join us today. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for being here. Thanks for the interest in our in our article. Okay. Just so the listeners know, um, when we choose articles from the Spine Deformity Journal to feature on our podcast, it's kind of a gestalt. It's a, it's a team effort to try to choose which one's the most interesting. But as a loyal listener, if you do have suggestions for which which folks we should interview, please reach out on uh, whatever medium you listen to the podcast on and let us know because we would love to hear your suggestions as well. But uh, today we're here with Dr. Zuckerman um, and we want to hear more about you and then also details about the paper. But let's uh, let's start um, about some general questions about your background. How did you decide to become a spine deformity surgeon? Yeah, I really, um, you know, I did my training at Vanderbilt uh, University and really enjoyed, realized I liked spine early on, PGY2 or PGY3 year, and just continue to study it and and do as much of it as I could as a resident. Uh, And I gravitated towards the bigger cases because those were the most interesting to me and the most fascinating, the most complex. And then I went on to do a fellowship at Columbia under Dr. Lenke, who's the senior author on this paper, uh, I should say. And really just, and now in my uh, early years in practice, uh, have continued to enjoy it, really enjoy the challenge of it. This is mind the form of scoliosis, in adults, which is which is mainly what I do, is uh, something we don't quite fully understand uh, the exact way to realign the spine, and it's a challenge. But if you get it right, you can really impact patients' lives uh, in a major way. You know, we did a su- study a couple of years ago that shows spinal deformity operations are the fourth biggest operation you can do in all of medicine behind behind a cabbage aortic repair and cystectomy. So they're major life changing operations, um, and I just continue to enjoy doing them and um, trying to get better at them each operation. Awesome. Um, I noticed in your profile that you're a professor in both the neurosurgery and orthopedic department uh, at Vanderbilt. How does that work and, and how does that affect your practice? Yeah, we have a great collaboration. I have uh, outstanding partners, both in neurosurgery and orthopedics. There are four uh, orthopedic spine surgeons here, Byron Stevens, Amir Abtahi, Ray Gardaki, and Julian uh, Lugo-Pico, all great, uh, great surgeons and great partners. We have a uh, um, multidisciplinary uh, conference every Thursday morning. We all get together in a room with our fellow. We do some teaching. We all each throw out cases and get advice from each other too. So I would say the collaboration between ortho and neuro is really strong here. This was modeled for me in fellowship with Dr. Linky and his view of uh, having both departments work together. And the ceiling is just so much higher in our medical center and our uh, spine center because we work together and our patient care is better. Uh, we all kind of um, catalyze each other with ideas from different perspectives. So it's a really great collaboration. I'm lucky to have such great partners in both departments. Awesome. And speaking of great collaborations, uh, let's focus in on this awesome article um, that that you worked on um, with some fabulous co-authors. Uh, why don't you give us kind of the quick journal club summary uh, of the yeah. paper? Yeah, sure. This was a study I worked on towards the tail end of my fellowship and it's been published since I was really consisting of patients, mostly Dr. Lenke and Dr. Ron Lima as well uh, at Columbia. And we looked at a total of um, 57 patients that all had two year follow ups. And we were asking a question and all patients were fused to the sacrum and pelvis, looking at what patients had rod fractures and why. And of 57 patients, we had overall low percentage. So nine patients or 16 percent had rod fractures. And then we uh, another part of the paper was describing how are multi rod constructs used? Uh, multi rod constructs are becoming a lot more popular these days. It's um, easier to do just to put in more rods. And I think the benefit of them is there uh, for sure, but it's something that we don't quite uh, have the science figured out on how many rods are ideal, how many rods are too many, what is the benefit of putting more than two rods in the, sp- in, in the spine. And so 57 patients, uh, 16% rod fracture. And what we found 
was that rod fractures most often occur, occurred one or two levels above an antibody, which is most often a TLIF. And also probably the biggest finding was that the major risk factor for rod fracture was a significant coronal correction of greater than three centimeters. Uh, in, in scoliosis and spine deformity, sagittal plane alignment gets uh, a ton of attention because that's most of what we see in adults. But major coronal malalignment issues and coronal changes of over three centimeters were a high risk for rod fracture because these are just such powerful corrections. Now, the reasons for that are multifactorial, and we could talk about that later, but that was the major finding that sagittal plane correction was not correlated with multi with rod fractures, but it was coronal plane correction uh, that was the biggest risk factor to having rod fractures. Yeah, we definitely will explore kind of why you think there is such that difference between um, kind of big sagittal correction versus big coronal correction. Um, but we can kind of start with some of the background information uh, for some of our listeners who may not often use multi-rod constructs. Um, in what sorts of cases do you recommend considering using an MRC? Yeah, and let me just back up a second. The term MRC is probably not the best term in the world. This is something pointed out by Mike Kelly. Uh, I heard at a conference, and he's exactly right. Multi rod construct. Think about it. Just means more than one rod. So every spine surgery. That's true. Every, every everything we do is multi rod. <laughs> so if I had to rephrase the title, I may have done that. But what we're getting at is more than two rods. So any uh, construct where you're putting a third, fourth, or fifth rod in. Um, so when your question, when do we put in multi rod constructs? I think it's comes to mind anytime I have an upper instrument, upper instrument of vertebrae of L2 uh, or above, just like you think about putting pelvic screws in, but it's not an all or none, always do it when you have a UIV of L2. Every patient's a little different, right? Some patient, uh, older patient with osteopenia or osteoporosis, I probably don't want to add a third uh, rod because it may make the spine too stiff and may predispose to PJK or PJF, but um, someone with good solid bone or if uh, certainly a, a correction of, you know, a UIV of uh, T11, T10, probably a good idea to use at least three, maybe four rods, um, really focusing on the lower lumbar levels, because in my opinion, those are the hardest levels to fuse, um, certainly across the lumbosacral junction and cephalad to where your inner bodies are, which are often lower down the lumbar spine to cover those levels where you don't have anterior column uh, support. Somewhat along those lines, how do you decide how many more than two rods to use? When do you use three versus four, even five sometimes? Yeah, I think um, if I'm doing a lower thoracic to pelvis fuse to sacrum fusion with, with pelvic instrumentation, uh, I will probably do four rods uh, and, and stagger them to where they end. So and somewhere in the mid lumbar spine and maybe an upper lumbar, lower thoracic spine. Um, upper thoracic uh, fusion, I probably do four rods, definitely um, spanning most of the correction and osteotomy is certainly a three column osteotomy uh, that's been done. Um, so I think Anything te lower thoracic or upper thoracic, I'd, I'd use four rods and make sure they, they cross the lumbosacral junction. Now, it's interesting. Sometimes I use dual-headed screws that are at the S1 level, uh, but lately I've been extending them to either put four, uh, four pelvic screws in or have a connector that goes past the S1 screw so there's so it really protects the lumbosacral junction. But that's kind of when I think about using three or four rod constructs. Five rod, rod constructs, I typically, if I use a kickstand rod, I'll have that extra rod lateral. So that sometimes lends itself to five rods across the, the uh, construct as well. Makes sense. Um, one interesting thing that I noted in the paper is that I mean, you had a pretty low rod fracture rate, which was awesome. Um, but you also had a significant number of those patients with rod fractures who didn't end up getting revisions. How did you decide which patients needed a revision and, and which ones were okay without it? Yeah, so nine patients had rod fractures, six of those had revisions. So there was a third that didn't have revisions. And low numbers overall. I mean, that's a testament to the quality of the work that uh, Dr. Lenke and Dr. Lehman do, because again, these are their, their patients. Uh, but three out of the six, three out of the nine did not need surgery. And I think if a patient has an, uh, one rod fracture and they're completely asymptomatic and no other implant failures, no set screws popping off, no screws getting loose, no other evidence of serothrosis, and certainly no symptoms, I personally would watch them. I think some surgeons may intervene because it's a sign of things to come, but I think a single rod fracture with no symptoms, I'd watch. I think a double rod, um, double rod fracture, uh, it's rare to have no symptoms with that, in my opinion. But if a patient was completely asymptomatic, I'd probably continue to watch that closely. You know, not send the patient out and never see them again, keep a close eye on them. Uh, when they start to develop symptoms, worsening pain is probably developing a symptomatic pseudoarthrosis. And then if you start to see haloing and other signs of uh, mechanical complications, probably best to intervene when they're becoming symptomatic uh, with additional radiographic evidence. Mm 
Makes sense. And what kind of imaging would you recommend in order to you know, assess pseudoarthrosis, especially when there's a whole bunch of metal and rods in the way? Yeah, I get the full gamut, you know, get uh, MRI, um, even though it can be hard to see. We can do a metal suppression MRI that helps uh, CT scan, CT myelogram also, so you can see the neural elements as well. Um, and of course, uh, standing x-rays to see if there are any alignment changes. Makes sense. Um, and and you mentioned kind of following these patients. Um, what was the average time to, to rod fracture in your paper? Yeah, I think it was most were within the two years. Some were outside the two years. Uh, so I think in... I think the spine deformity journal doesn't accept papers unless you have two year follow up. So two years is the mark that, you know, and, and some, I just saw a recent paper about this. Once you hit the two year mark, the rate of mechanical complications goes way down, but they can still happen three years, five years, et cetera. So once you, I think following them two year mark, you can take a breath, but not too big a breath. And then seeing them yearly to five years and then maybe spacing it out after that uh, would be appropriate. But I think the two year mark is certainly what we all uh, hope to get patients to without any issues. Makes total sense. And so in general, with your paper, what overall lessons should adult deformity surgeons kind of take away from it? Yeah, I think don't forget about the coronal plane. Uh, again, there's a lot of ton of emphasis on the sagittal plane, the Russell classification, gap score, uh, lumbar distribution index. And that's, I think, critical, super important. Uh, but coronal alignment is, is sometimes talked about a little, little bit less. Um, and those can sometimes be harder to correct. Uh, you certain, hopefully if it's flexible, you can correct with just PCOs, posterior column osteotomies, but if they're really rigid, you may need to do uh, three column osteotomy or an asymmetric, uh, pedicle subtraction osteotomy. So they can be challenging to correct. And also I think the fact that they come with more complications, including rod fractures is a sign that, uh, these are more the more challenging plane to correct, especially if you have a biplanar deformity. Uh, so I would say, don't forget about the coronal plane. Uh, and even though it's talk, it talks about less, making sure you have your alignment goals and also intraoperatively looking, preoperatively looking how they stand, looking at the acetabuli. Some people have a leg length discrepancy. Some people stand with their even, uh, some people stand with the right side higher than the left. So knowing intraoperatively, you can't just look in the spine and see if the head is up because you don't know what the hips are doing intraoperatively. Um, this is a little bit outside the paper, but just mentioning the overall coronal plane. So matching up interop, taking interop x-rays where you can see bilateral acetabuli, femoral heads, knowing how they are on the table, comparing that to how they're going to stand postoperatively, which is how they stand on their preoperative x-rays, and just being aware of some of these um, uh, coronal principles because it's, it's challenging, it's complex, especially when you're in the seventh or eighth or ninth hour of a long surgery. Uh, taking out these final considerations can be uh, mentally challenging in addition to, uh, you know, working for nine or ten hours physically. Yeah, I, I'm so glad you mentioned taking some of those intraoperative um, x-rays. What do you typically do uh, during your cases? Do you have the radiology techs bring in kind of a long film or, or, or what do they do for you? Yeah, we, we have a stitching film that we use. Usually they take two x-rays and they can cover uh, skull to bilateral acetabuli. Uh, but I'll do both. We have a T-hand. Before we got that stitching uh, technology, we had a T-hand, sort of a T-bar, that I would take a C-arm low down and line them up on the femoral heads. Again, make, making sure I knew how they stood preoperatively. So if one high was one, one um, leg was higher than the other and lining that up with intraop and then intraoperatively and seeing where the T-bar went and knowing where I want it to be. So that's the first step. If you don't have a stitching film, the stitching technology that we got is outstanding. And I use that almost on every uh, case that's a, any kind of deformity case. Uh, just as a way to check our work and make sure what I think I'm seeing intraoperatively is in fact what, what, how they'll stand uh, post-op, both in the coronal and the sagittal plane. Um, yeah, that's a super helpful tip and, and super important to remember. Um, what are your next areas you're thinking about studying? Yeah, I think, the, the like I said, multi-rods or more than two rods in the spine is, is a hot topic. And some people think it's gone a bit overboard. It's a lot easier to put third, fourth, or fifth rod it is than it is to do better carpentry or more PCOs or more uh, osteotomy. So some people think, I think it may lend itself to putting too much metal and thinking that's the answer, but it's probably not. I think the general notion is, and I'm not sure this has been proven, but that more rods you put in doesn't fix a rod fracture, but it just delays it. It's a lot harder to break three, four or five rods than it is two rods. So maybe we're delaying issues, but maybe we're preventing them. We just don't know. So I think looking at the, like you, like you mentioned, uh, time to rod fracture, also, the type of metal that we're going to use. Um, titanium may be best for someone with poor bone quality. Cobalt chrome may be a bit stiff. I almost always use 6-0 cobalt chrome. Uh, but 
is it okay to mix metal somehow sometime maybe the main rods will be titanium and the satellite rods will be uh, cobalt chrome we just don't know the answers to these questions and also what number is optimal three four five etc uh, so looking at metal type how many uh, rods are needed and in what scenarios matching it up with the patient's biology and their bone quality i think are all uh, potential areas of future research that we really don't have answers for yet those are fascinating questions, um, and we wish you luck with the ongoing study of this area. Are you planning future collaborations um, with Dr. Yeah, Lenke's yeah, of course. Group? I mean, Dr. lenke has got his army of fellows now, so uh, I think we'll focus on doing our single center studies at Vanderbilt. But I, like I said, I work closely with uh, my partners, Byron Stevens and Mirab Tahi, on some of our deformity work. And uh, our single center database has almost about 350, 400 patients in it, so we're starting to get longer follow-up with that. Um, and and really hopefully looking at what's been done at our institution over the last 10, 12 years. And certainly things have changed a lot in scoliosis deformity surgery. So what they were doing 10, 15 years ago, um, we're certainly not doing now. We'd like to think we've improved. Uh, but looking at long-term follow-up on patients, and I think at this issue of rod failures and rod fractures and how many rods are used, uh, I think is something we'll continue to study. And like I said, number of rods, type of metal used, and if we can see any patterns or um, new uh, new insights into those areas is what we'll focus on. Great. Well, we look forward to hearing more from you and and uh, and your group and uh, hoping to get some answers to some of these questions. Well, thank you so much for joining us on our Scoliosis Dialogues podcast today. And thank you listeners for coming on this journey with us. Uh, and please join us again in a couple of weeks when our next episode comes out as well. Yeah, thanks thank for having so me much, I really appreciate uh, the opportunity. Yeah, and of course, just want to mention a huge thank you to all our, our co-authors and the senior authors, Dr. Lenking, Dr. Lehman, whose patients made up the majority of uh, this entire sample. So a uh, big thank you to all the researchers at Columbia and my co-fellows as well, who were instrumental in getting this, uh, getting this project done and um, are really thankful for their collaboration. The Scoliosis Research Society is a nonprofit professional organization made up of physicians and allied health personnel. Their primary focus is on providing continuing medical education for healthcare professionals and on funding and supporting research in spinal deformities. Please visit srs.org for further information. 